Just a brief reminder at the top of the show that we're supporting No Shave November, a cancer research and awareness charity that asks you to help fund the efforts of folks like St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, the Prevent Cancer Foundation, and Fight CRC by forgoing the usual batch of shaving supplies and instead donate the cost of those items for the month while letting your beard grow. You can find the donation link in the description for this episode. Welcome back to GM Word of the Week. We had a week off for health reasons, but things are back on track now, and we find ourselves still looking at the middle of November with a sense of bewilderment, wondering how it is we even got this far into the year in the first place. Surely the odds were against it. In any case, we're about to be very thankful Americans by the end of the month, and as you may know, we like to celebrate such things with the giant feast with all our friends and family gathered around to help. Except, of course, this is 2020, and none of that is really going to be allowed. Or at least, it will be advised to do so only with great caution. So probably this year we'll have to skip inviting Great Uncle Twice Removed Edwin, whom we never really invited in the first place and just seemed to show up every year anyway with a box of cheap wine. As if expensive wine came in boxes. At least we finally have an excuse to keep him out. Now, we make a big deal of the food and drinks on display at these annual Thanksgiving feasts. And, as we have previously on this podcast, we often showcase particular items of edible fare in an effort to enlighten you about their origins and trace their path to inclusion at our tables. But this year, we're doing things a little differently. See, a lot goes into preparing those dishes besides just preparing those dishes. And really, the story of that preparation is rarely told, which is a shame, because not telling that story often hides just how difficult it was to produce them, and the sorts of sacrifices and discoveries necessary to make preparation possible in the first place. Take the previous episode as an example. As we discovered, the history of applying heat to food with a stove or oven was so basic and unchanged for such a long, a long time that it was only relatively recently that someone decided to do anything about it, thereby improving everyone's lives and making cooking and baking generally easier for almost everyone. Even so, even with the late development of improved methods of getting the heat to the thing you wanted to eat, some things still haven't really changed. Some things are, in fact, so old and essential to the basic process that they go even further back than we can really work out so far back that they weren't so much made originally as found. But even in those very early forms, they are still absolutely recognizable as the very things that sit on and in your stove to this day. The essentials of preparing food for consumption. Pots and pans. And we're pretty sure that even if you profess not to be a cook or a baker or a chef, you've still got at least one of each. One pot one pan. If nothing else, you've probably worked out how to cook the traditional desperate college student fare of ramen noodles and grilled cheese sandwiches. One pot, one pan, it's all you need. So let's dig in and see where these things come from and how they developed and what having them means versus not having them at all. How have pots and pans changed not only our methods of cooking, but what we cook as well. After all, everything on your Thanksgiving spread was probably in one or the other of them. So, let's give thanks to Pots and Pans. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Way! way back in our history, and you'll be familiar with this particular brand of way, way back in history from earlier episodes of the show, in which we have a concept that certainly must have started somewhere, but no definite evidence of when or where that was. Way, way back in history, the very first cooking was almost certainly roasting, as we discussed last episode. There's not much art right off the bat in putting a piece of meat or a sturdy vegetable into a fire and then drawing it out again at some desired level of cooked. Not at first, at least. 
Later advancement, as discussed, led to the invention of a chef, someone who knows how to do these things to a degree that pleases the people who are to consume said meat or vegetable. Which is all well and good for meats and sturdy vegetables, but doesn't do much for something more delicate. For instance, what do you do if you and your group of fellow early grunters live near the ocean and don't have access to things like deer and boar and a robust rutabaga? Say instead that you have to make do with mussels and clams and maybe the occasional fish, along with some questionable berries. How then do you roast these? You can, of course, roast them, but they present a number of problems to the traditional methods of roasting. For one thing, it's really difficult and not very worthwhile to thread a clam onto a roasting spit and then hold it over the fire for the not very long amount of time it takes to go from raw to way too overcooked to be edible. For another, soft-fleshed foods tend to fall apart when aggressively roasted in an open flame and fall into the fire itself, where it provides almost no nutritional value. Wasted effort, in effect. Fortunately, your basic clam comes with its own cookware. Amazingly enough, clam shells are almost exactly the same size as the clam they contain, and by laying these near the fire instead of in it or over it, you can cook as many clams as you can fit around the fire without much fear of coming back with an ashy lump that is less than delicious. As an added bonus, the shell will contain all the wonderful liquor produced by the clam as it cooks, and you'll soon learn to prize this as a tasty addition to the meal. There is an argument to be made that the basic shellfish shell was some of the first cookware deliberately used for the purpose by early man. Certainly, the remains of heated or burned shells have been found in some of the earliest settlements. However, there is another candidate for first cookware used. Consider what we learned about roasting last time. You build a big fire, and then, to keep it from burning you and your possessions up, you also put a ring around that fire made up of rocks and stones. Well, the interesting thing is, if you happen to be an early science brain, you'll notice that those rocks get hot. And with a careful bit of experimentation, you might also discover that things placed on those hot rocks also get hot. Hot enough to cook, even as the big hunk of meat roasting on the spit cooks. So, a flat enough hot rock becomes a place where you can cook things that aren't otherwise suited to the usual methods of roasting. Small or soft fruits and vegetables, delicate or loose-fleshed fish and seafood, and some of the softer bits of large animals would be well suited to cooking on a rock next to the fire. In particular, these might be very good for cooking up pastes of half-chewed or mashed-together grain and liquid mixtures into some of the first bread-like substances. They can be watched so they don't burn, and the rocks provide a way to contain their otherwise sloppy characteristics until they firm up. Pretty soon, you don't move camp without making sure to bring along the pizza stone. The problem is, of course, neither of these two methods really get you your morning tea. And we all know how important our morning tea is around here. If not, just listen to our episode on tea, and you'll hear how absolutely vital it is to our well-being and the history of the planet. And we suppose you can listen to the coffee episode as well, if you feel you must. Whatever. Anyway, the important thing lacking for a healthy dose of English breakfast first thing in the morning was a way to boil water. The thing is, working out how to boil water isn't so obvious. After all, there's no naturally occurring method for boiling water. It's not like lightning is going to strike and suddenly produce tea biscuits for everyone. Or is there? In Wakarirarira in New Zealand, a series of boiling geothermal pools have been used by the Maori for hundreds of years. They'd place fruits, vegetables, and meats in little bags made of flax and lower them into the boiling water until cooked. In Iceland, they still make a rye bread by burying a tin full of dough in the earth near hot springs for 24 hours until it has been fully steamed. For people living near such geothermal resources, these cooking methods were easily accessible and required minimal effort on their part to take advantage of. Tie something to a stick or a length of string, dip it in the hot water until it seemed to be done, and then enjoy. Sure, you might lose something occasionally, but overall, the reward was worth the risk. 
However, if you didn't live near these sorts of resources, getting the idea to boil your food was more problematic. For one thing, if what you wanted was hot food, you were well advised to keep water as far away from your fire as possible. Even way back in the just out of the trees years, it didn't take people long to realize water and fire just do not mix. What you got was cold and damp. What you needed in order to come up with boiling before anything else was a way to keep the water and the fire apart reliably and then a way to work out the process by which water could be heated without extinguishing the fire. And sure, you can imagine, as many anthropologists have, that boiling first occurred in shells. But as we pointed out earlier, shells tend to be the size of the thing they are protecting, which is not a lot of volume in which to boil anything more substantial. You might imagine there were giant versions of clams available, which there are, but even so, these weren't widely available enough to make the necessary change in the way people as a whole cooked, which is what boiling did. Some folks have suggested that gourds and bamboo might have served the purpose, but again, these weren't widespread enough to offer up the sweeping change necessary. No, instead, the most likely candidate for the first makeshift teapot was something every animal came with. A stomach. So brace yourself as we explain the basic idea and discovery here. Chances are, if you were early man and went out hunting or scavenging, eventually you might come across an animal which you thought would turn out to be pretty delicious. That was the whole point, after all. But Equally likely was the fact that the animal you were looking at and smacking your lips over had also, earlier in the day, been smacking its lips over something it found particularly delicious and eaten it. Meaning that whatever it had eaten was still sitting around inside its stomach being digested by the time you happened upon the creature and started thinking about roast beast sandwiches. Well, a couple of spears and arrows later, and you now had a dinner that had effectively stuffed itself on your behalf. All you had to do was drag it back home and toss it on, in, or near the fire, according to your preference, in order to cook the whole thing up, stomach and all. And at that point, if you were still the same science-minded individual who worked out the whole hot rock thing, you might notice that the stomach cooked up pretty well, and was full of many delicious things, and also that the stomach itself was seemingly some sort of container, some sort of waterproof container. At which point the little primitive torch would come on over your head, and you'd say, Ugug! Which we all know translates to, Aha! Suddenly, you could invent haggis. The stomach, as stuffed, waterproof boiling container, had just been discovered. 30,000 years ago, all these various methods we've talked about combined to finally show us how we didn't have to cook everything directly in the fire. Instead, we could cook indirectly and achieve one of the greatest technological revolutions cooking had ever and would ever see until modern times. Part of the reason it's so hard to nail down the development of cooking throughout history is because so much of the equipment and tools used were essentially disposable and temporary. At least, their use was temporary, if not their actual existence. There are two intermediate steps from the basic first stomach pot that would have been easy to miss on the way to the more durable cookware. And it amazes us, to a certain extent, they even ever worked at all. Now, obviously, a stomach was not always to hand when one was wanted, and it was important to work out how to make a replica stomach that could do the same job as a real stomach, but be both more permanent and more handy when needed. And remember, you had to be able to both hold water and then boil it in whatever you came up with. So the natural next step, since stomachs came from animals, was to try other bits of animals and see if they could do the same job. And sure enough, it turned out there were other bits of animals that could hold water. In fact, there were lots of other bits, and we are, to a certain extent, going to leave some of that up to your imagination. Suffice it to say that a leather bowl could be made which would hold water and could also take the heat, provided you were very careful to keep it wet through. Easy enough to do while it is full of water and boiling, harder to do as the liquid boils off, but still manageable if you were careful and observant. Otherwise, it would simply cook and fall apart. 
The leather bowl is a very real implement, not only used prehistorically, but still in use by various tribes and other interested parties around the world today. And it's pretty much a direct line of development from the leather bowl to the cast iron cauldron we so often associate with the medieval kitchen to this day. As new materials came into use, everything from clay to copper, brass, iron, aluminum, and so on, was used to develop ever more refined versions of the leather bowl or cauldron. From there came smaller and bigger cauldrons, cooking and stew pots, and eventually the saucepan. A similar development, the bowl made of woven branches and leaves, could be made too. Provided you never let the flames touch beyond the level of the water inside, you could heat water to your heart's content. And here we begin to wonder if maybe a little wooden bowl, incidentally made from tea leaves, wasn't the real discovery made in China. But that's just speculation on our part. Relatively speaking, early in the development of cooking, it was discovered that it was far easier to cook if you brought the heat to the food rather than having to take the food to the heat anytime you wanted a grilled sandwich. You got better control of the cooking, and so less burning and eating of ashes occurred. You could take the little baskets everyone was weaving or sewing out of leather and fill them with water, and then put some of the hot rocks from around the fire into them, causing the water to boil almost instantly. At which point you could boil up whatever food you wanted in a more controlled environment. Things too hot? Take a rock out and let it cool a bit. Too cold? Add more hot rocks. If you wanted to dry cook rather than boil everything, you could take the same bowl and add hot coals from the fire to it in order to cook whatever you laid in the bowl on top of them. And one of the things you could do to make the whole thing last longer, keep the heat in, and cook more thoroughly was to bury the whole thing in the ground and let it sit for a few hours. The heat wouldn't escape as quickly as doing it in the open air, and you could let it sit until you and the rest of your fellows were ready to eat. And so cooking with hot rocks and cooking in pits developed. But what if you needed to be on the road? It's hard to haul an entire pit around with you when you're a nomadic tribe who has to follow the food in order to eat the food. Well, if you happen to think of it, you might decide that the thing to do was to take a smaller pit with you. Which you could do if you had access to mud and clay. See, you could make up your bowl of hot rocks or coals and whatever food you wanted to eat, and then seal it all up inside mud or clay thereby insulating it and making it possible to pack around, carefully. The food would happily cook inside, insulated from the outside world. All you had to do at the end of the day was to break open the now hardened mud or clay and remove your little pot of food from inside, all cooked and ready to go. And how long is it until you work out the step you can skip to make things easier? That's right. Do away with a little woven or leather bowl and just make your pots out of the clay and mud. Shape them and put them in the fire to cook beforehand, and you have a little purpose-built cooking bowl or pot. Now, between the flat rocks you were packing around to do your baking on and the clay bowls you were doing your boiling in, you had a full set of cookware, pots and pans. You vent a lid, and it was no longer necessary to destroy the vessel to get at the food inside. And that's basically the way it stayed for many years. Naturally, things were refined and improved on as time passed. The rocks got less heavy and started being made from various metals as we developed that technology. But the pots were also refined, not only to reflect the latest technological advancements, but also to reflect the various needs of the sort of cooking that was gradually developing as techniques were created, refined, and improved. Soon, everyone had purpose-built pots to do their cooking in particularly suited to the kind of cooking they did. Of course, the real advantage of the pot was the one sort of food they could cook that couldn't be cooked any other way. Porridge. At a time when agriculture was just starting to be a thing, a new sort of food came along just begging to be taken advantage of. Grains. Wheat, maize, rice, and other starches were positioned to really take over the human diet, and the clay pot was there to do the job of boiling them up and making them available to us. We went from meats, nuts, and seeds to softened grains, fruits, and vegetables almost at a stroke. Not only that, 
but the clay pot also opened up other foods to us that might otherwise be toxic. By allowing for the regular boiling of various plants, like the South American cassava, which contains cyanide, the poison is removed and the tuber made edible. Now it's a rich, safe source of nutrition, not just in South America, but also Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and many other places around the world. And then, well, and then, you could develop the whole clay pot thing further and come up with ceramic griddles to replace the old heavy rocks with and make things very like pancakes and flatbreads. And larger pots could be used to make and distill alcohol, a development for which very many people will thank you indeed. As we got better at the whole metal thing, pots became frying pans, cake pans, stew pots, and more, becoming ever more specialized as new techniques and new foods were discovered. Soon you had special pans for cooking fish and special pots for making syrups, double boilers for speeding up the cooking time, and vessels for tempering chocolate, and by Roman times, it was hard to find a kitchen that didn't look like some sort of specialized modern-day cookery store all on its own. In fact, so advanced, specialized, and detailed were the tools found in the typical Roman kitchen of the day that it wasn't until the 20th century that they were surpassed by the advent of multi-layered metal cookware. The idea with multi-layered pots and pans is that not all metals have the same heat properties. Some heat up quickly, but don't retain the heat. Other metals hold heat well, but take forever to heat up. Some don't spread the heat and create hot spots. Others spread too well and never get sufficiently hot. By layering the metals one with the other, you can create cookware, particularly pans, that exhibit the best qualities of multiple metals to produce a pan that heats quickly, retains its heat, and spreads that heat evenly throughout the cooking surface. And that's where we stand today. Thanks to very recent advances in the technology used to create pots and pans, we can finally cook the perfect meal for our loved ones at Thanksgiving. It only took us a few hundred years since the Romans went away to get to that point, but it practically guarantees that there is no longer any excuse for the arrival on our tables of those horrendous, overboiled, gray-green Brussels sprouts from our childhood memories. And in truth, it has been a few years since we've seen those. So for that alone, we give thanks not just to the first prehistoric human who worked out how to cook things in the first place, but to the modern day scientists and engineers who came up with the pots and pans that have forever banished it. We hope. Thanks for listening to this week's GM Word of the Week episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to hear more, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com, which is where we like to keep all our older episodes. This episode, and indeed the last episode, were in part informed by the book Consider the Fork, A History of How We Cook and Eat by B. Wilson. You can find an Amazon affiliate link to the book in our episode description. We've chosen to participate in No Shave November, in part because it should be easy in this time of lockdown to take part, but mostly because it benefits cancer research and prevention. No Shave November is a month-long journey, during which participants forgo shaving and grooming in order to evoke conversation and raise cancer awareness. The goal of No Shave November is to grow awareness by embracing our hair, which many cancer patients lose, and letting it grow wild and free. Donate the money you would typically spend on shaving and grooming to educate about cancer prevention, save lives, and aid those fighting the battle. You can do so by joining us at the GM Word of the Week team page at noshave.org or by following the link in the episode description. Normally at this point we'd ask you to join our patrons on Patreon and help support our show, but in November we're asking you to hold off on pledging that support and instead donate towards No Shave November. We'd appreciate it. Today's episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, owner of several pans and probably at least one pot somewhere. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions, which you can, of course, find 
at sessions.blue, where they very recently posted up several new albums worth of music to peruse. Personally, I say out of the frying pan and into the deadly pit filled with sharks who are wielding chainsaws with killer kittens stapled to them. However, that one's having a rough time catching on. 